You swing the door open and reveal a large room with stone floors and walls. The sound of your footsteps echo faintly off the high ceilings and the smell of mildew hangs heavy in the air. Let me uh, let me pull up the map. Uh, this isn't loading for me. I, I can't see anything. Oh, um, it's dark. I have dark vision, though, and I still can't see anything. Oh, wait, hang on. Sorry, maybe this is the wrong map. Okay, all right, here we go. Oh, it, is that a carnival? Are we supposed to be seeing this? Or? Okay, um, never mind. Let me just, I'll just describe it. Hey! hey. I'm your host, Sarah, and... I'm your other host, Morgan. We're two sisters. By marriage. Who love to talk about stories. From writing fiction to creating elaborate plot lines in D&D. To keeping combat going with maps or theater of the mind. We're... Out of, of initiative. initiative. In this episode of Out of Initiative, we explore the age-old debate of theater of the mind versus making battle maps. As longtime players ourselves, we've experienced the pros and cons of each approach, and we're excited to explore this topic in depth. Let's talk about how these two styles of gameplay enhance or detract from the overall dungeon crawling experience, and the various creative strategies that can be employed to get the most out of both. So, full disclosure, I'm a map gal myself. Uh, Sarah, do you prefer maps, theater of the mind, or some combination See, of the two? I think because I started in your group, Morgan, with you as my DM, that I lean more towards maps. But since I've been running our current campaign, I'm starting to back off a little bit. Uh, it's tough, though, because as we've discussed with like Curse of Strahd being such a popular campaign and module that people run, there are tons of battle maps and I feel I, I, I like using them all <laughs> because there's a lot of really iconic points and iconic battles and that kind of thing. But I've noticed lately that I'm a little, I'm holding them back a little bit more and waiting before I transition everybody. And that's something I know we've talked about too, where you get them on the map too soon. Then um and they take get distracted. Off. They take off or they just are looking at that and not listening to what you're trying to say. So yeah. I I'm starting to become like an in-between kind of person. There's also a few uh online games, streaming games, some big uh D D. DMs that don't use battle maps like at all. And I've always been fascinated how they do that. And so I've been trying to like watch and study them and figure out if their players are still engaged. And if so, why and how and how are they running actual combat? Because I think that's the biggest appeal to a lot of battle maps is the combat. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard as a player, like I, from the DM perspective, I always find myself gravitating toward maps, whether I find them or make them. And as a player, uh, it helps for sure that you are an excellent scene setter, describer of senses. Uh, that's something that I'm really weak at as a DM. And I certainly am not going to get stronger when I continue to just like leverage a map, right? Like that's not making me any yeah, better at it. Yeah, yeah. But um, as a player, sometimes I find that I really struggle to track the the through line. Like, we, where are we? What's it look like? I, like, if I can't picture it, I'm really caught just trying to use. I'm like, we're that those two little brain cells trying their hardest, rubbing together, just like trying to come up with an image of what you are describing. Because if I can't, if I can't get there, then I can't engage. Like, I don't know how to engage with it. Uh, and some of that's play style. Some of that's neurodivergence. Some of that's like just what we're used to right but i i that's one thing that's like i really need this the scene thoroughly set uh and whether that's like because we have an ambient image uh while we sit and listen in you know like wrapped focus while you describe something uh and then be prepared to ask questions um but yeah that's i i find that i i prefer as a player having something to look at and understand what you have in your head because if i'm way off i'm gonna like probably not go like I'm probably not going to interact with the scene the way you're expecting. I'm glad you mentioned about like helping you focus. I know I've read articles on people with ADHD and playing 
Dungeons and Dragons or TTRPG games and they need the visual, it just it there's been tons and tons of people weighing in that say that they just it helps them focus, it helps them stay in the moment and present. And even if they're just staring at it while the DM is talking, it gives them just a better experience and be more engaged. So I'm glad you brought that up. But I I think that when a player is in a new situation, when you present them with a new scene, as you were saying, your decisions are based on what you're seeing, what you're perceiving. And you try and separate the character from the player, but you're still acting on behalf of your character. And yeah, if you enter some, like you say, oh, you're going into this person's home. Well, there could be a million different things. You could see like, skeletons literally hanging from the ceiling or you could see it's really clean or you could see you know there's a bunch of people in there because it's a party and it's going to change your whole choices that you make and i just i think that just allows for more control of your character um and i'm not saying you couldn't describe that without a map but you would have to be as a dm extremely thorough to really lay that scene out and sometimes I've noticed it's just easier to put a map up and then just give like yeah. a line or two of detail and let the players absorb the rest. Um, otherwise you're just talking nonstop and just giving a bunch of descriptions of walls and floors and everything else. So, and the, how you know, the, the essentials. Ceilings. Yes. Yeah. It's always the ceilings. So I put that in all my notes. They're 10 feet, they're 20 feet, whatever. So, because it's always, I don't know what's with players. And wanting to know the ceilings, but like, what are you guys doing? Are you always trying to do a fireball? Are you always trying to, what are we doing? So I, it's funny because I think a lot of players gravitate toward, um, you know, the perpetually banned Eric uh, mm -hmm. which is allowed in, in our games. Yes. But that was one of those things yeah. like, how high is the ceiling? Can I fly there? Especially the old build of the Eric before they were reworked in was Morning Titans, I think. I think so, um, yeah. The old version, the air coker was faster in flight than they were on foot. It was 25 foot walking speed and a 50 foot flying speed. That's so, fast. so it was like, is this it? That's yeah. so fast. That's yeah, so fast. they brought that back. Yeah. Uh, because that means, like, is the ceiling high enough that I can get up off the ground? I'm four feet tall and it's a 10 foot ceiling. Is that enough for me to get into the air and move faster across the room? Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, learning the hard way that tabaxi climb speed will really shoot you in the foot. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because he's like gonna scuttle on up the walls and make their way directly to it was the uh, vault of dragons at the end of Waterdeep Dragon Heist that the player was like, oh well, I have a climb speed, so I'll just you know one player climbs, one player flies, the other ones you had like boots of levitation, and it was like, oh, and yeah. I don't get to play with any of this map. You guys are gonna cloak. go straight there. I had a cloak that I could fly. Right. We had the one cloak. character that could not fly. And that kind of sucked. I felt bad. They were always grounded. Well, but, the player is canonic. The the character yeah. was canonically afraid of heights, which is funny True. because the player is afraid of heights. And it was yeah. just kind of a, like, I love giving characters quirks. Yeah. So theater of the mind, I'm bad at running that. I know that that's mm -hmm. not my forte. Um, mm -hmm. And I would love to get better at it. Mm -hmm. So I've got some basics, right? Like I know I need to describe, we say the five senses, right? Just like writing yes. a book. Yeah. What do the players feel on their skin? What do they smell? What do they hear? What do they see? What do the walls taste like if they lick them? I mean, we don't really get into that very much, but sometimes. Um, so, but that, that feels pretty basic. Like, what else do I need to make sure that I'm communicating a scene effectively so the players can understand what I'm trying to demonstrate? Well, that definitely comes into play. Or is this just an exploration or is this an actual battle? Because I think those are two very, very different things. If they're just wandering through a town, you don't have to necessarily describe everything. You just wait until they ask for something. Uh, and which I think is, <laughs> I think that's all DMs. Uh, that store, that clothing store didn't exist until the character asked for it. Unless yeah. there's a specific place you want them to find or to point out, um, I would just give them yeah you're walking through town it's pretty quiet it's morning it's not raining there's people out shopping and i would just keep it really basic so then 
you can just fill in the details as the players ask, well, are there any guards nearby or is there a horse that I could steal or is there somewhere <laughs> I can get some food or whatever? And I think it just, it, you just allow the players to guide you. But yeah, the five senses, however, however, I have discovered if you <laughs> give too much detail, like you hear a dog barking nearby, they're going to go look at like, they're going to go look at the dog or they're going to look for the dog. Or if you, um, I don't know, you smell, they smell meat roasting. They're going to go look for the meat or it's like you put these, you, whatever detail you put in, you need to be prepared to expand on that because it, you don't know what is going to pique their curiosity. And so sometimes just being really vague is better because then you let them kind of direct which way they want to go and you're not drawing them off <laughs> random stuff. So I, I think describing in detail, if they're just, if some are kind of general, but when it comes to battles, like if there's an encounter or combat, then you're going to have to get really nitty gritty. And I think that's something we've talked about. If you're trying to have combat without a map, it is extremely hard. And you as a DM are going to have to either have a map yourself or know exactly where things are because it's just going to be hard to keep juggling where track of, you know, the monsters are, the bad guys are, and where your people are. Um, and yeah, that's, that's something I would just always lean on a map for combat. And then it's just exploring. Then you could probably be a little bit pulled back a little bit. When we talk about like a map for combat, mm -hmm. do you consider the grid paper and the dry erase marker uh, or the wet erase markers? Do we consider that a map? Because that's sometimes that's all I need. Yeah, no, I would consider that a map. And I would consider, as I said, I've watched some other professional DMs play online without maps for combat. And they are very specific when they say a guard approaches you they draw their sword, they are 10 feet from you, what do you do? And I mean, but to be able to juggle where everyone is, I, I mean, I'm impressed that they're able to do like there's That's three hard. or four guards. It's really hard, but they are specific and it's nothing as flowery and it is very formulaic. They are 10 feet from you, they draw their sword, what do you do? Or you see a wizard 20 feet from you preparing to cast a spell. What do you do? And that kind of, you know what I mean? And you just are very defined about where things are. But there are instances where, as I was saying, when you're exploring, you kind of let the characters direct where they're going. Someone could say, well, we're at the, um, you know, the entrance to a castle. And someone could say, well, there's stairs nearby. Or is there something I can climb a pillar? And the DM could be like, yeah, there's a pillar 20 feet from you, 20 feet up. Well, if you had a map, that wouldn't exist. Like it possibly that you just came up with that. So you kind oh, of inhibit yeah. you in a little bit. Yeah. By, by having the map, it's fixed. Well, I mean, you could always say to the players, yeah, there's a pillar. You just don't see it on the map. But I think their decisions are based on what they're seeing. At least me as a player. I know what I see is what I get. Right. And if you have theater of the mind, you could be like, yeah, there's a pillar. Right, you know, twenty feet. You, you can take all of your movement and be able to climb it. And if you were just fixated on what was there, you wouldn't. You wouldn't get that. So, or you can say no. I suppose <laughs> you can be like, nope, there's no pillars. But <laughs> that's not just, what I have in my head. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Nope, that's that's not there. So I, it does limit you in some ways. Um, constrains you to exactly what how you figured this map would go. I would recommend if, again, if you're a fairly new DM or maybe you've been doing it for a while, but just want to improve when you're creating your maps, definitely add other elements to it. I know we talked about like just the grid, but I would put in stairs or pillars or walls, that kind of thing, just to add more elements for your players to play around with. So it's not so plain. Um, and I, I think that just makes more interesting combat. I think something you touched on when you're talking about like the five senses, but keep it simple. Don't go too far. Whatever you say, they're going to explore. Uh, something I struggle with when setting scenes, um, both with and without maps, uh, is remembering that what the players 
should hear is what the characters like the characters would observe some of these things so yeah yeah enter a town and you hear the general like normal sounds of a town there are people talking and dogs barking and like Mm -hmm. chickens clucking in the in the distance and at the same time you would also give things like you hear that there is an absence of sound in the town like it is eerily quiet it is you know for some reason you hear a lot of animals but you don't hear any dogs um there are no dogs no anywhere dogs. in Vandalin. No dogs in Vandalin. <sighs> Poor Vio. Um, so I just think uh, that like one piece is trying to remember what the characters would notice. And then mm-hmm. being able to say, like, well, so your character would recognize that this flower box that has flowers in it does look like a normal flower box and there's nothing there's nothing to continue to investigate here you would know yep your yes your character is 100 percent aware that that's a daffodil and that it doesn't need to be done mm. you're digging it up anyway okay you mm. know like being mm. able to like this is what your character knows um but you mentioned uh getting kind of derailed by details that are or are not on the map and yes. that kind of leads me to one of the big cons of maps one thing i really struggle with is i really can almost never say uh so here's the map except imagine xyz isn't there or imagine there's an xyz here um yeah Yeah. that like the the cognitive dissonance of that for me is never very fun because it's like hey but whatever it is i just need it to be exactly that map which means i need to find an exact map of what i want or i need to change the encounter to match exactly what we can see yep. in the map and then right. it is yes fixed mm-hmm. it's going to be whatever's there that's it and i've noticed that when we've i've given you a map and a player has asked a question like oh what's this i think it was a uh, curse of strad and there were the monoliths and there's supposed to be three and there was four on the map yeah and i had a character ask why is there a fourth monolith and i was like just pretend it's not there it's not supposed to be there and so I think even the players too, like what they see is what they get. I think they really like n- not, you know, and then, so then the one time, like you were saying, then I feel bad, like this isn't the right map or I'm, you know, I'm letting it, everyone astray. And so it is, it is really hard to find just the right map and spending time finding it versus if I had just been like, you're in a grassy knoll and there are three stone pillars about 15 feet high surrounding it. And then let everyone else kind of fill in the details on their own. Uh, But one of the pressures as a DM is when you describe something or you tell your players something, it's like, and we've talked about this being like improv on stage. Like once you say it, it's real and you can't take it back. I mean, you could, but it's like once it has been spoken, uh, it is, it is real. And so there's a little bit of nerves when you're describing something without a map that you say something and then you're like, crap, like that's, I shouldn't have said that. And now I need to deal with the consequences of that. And where you have a map, you, you've already looked at the map, you know, it's like a reality that you have already accepted and you're okay with every, most of the time, if you've evaluated it, it, it exists and you're okay with that. And there's no nerves about something you said wrong. And, um, but yeah, it's just, it's like live, live film or live action. Like once you say it, it's out there in the world, uh, you better be able to back it up. So, or the consequences. So I think leaning on maps, like you were saying, I I wouldn't say they're a crutch, but there are instances where I'm describing, it's just nice to just put the map out there and it's like a assured thing that I don't have to worry about saying the wrong thing or describing the wrong thing or whatever. Do you ever find that you give a detail and then you forget the detail later when the players are like, so about that staircase, you're like, what staircase? All the time, all the time, <laughs> all the time. Uh, and you guys remember players are so like, and why, why are you remembering that there's a door there? Or, or you guys will ask, well, what's this door to? It's a closet, you know, like I didn't think you were going to go that way. Uh And that's something that comes back to I've seen a lot of cons with maps is the uh, game is slowed down if the players feel the need to open every door and look in every video game logic. Yes, it slows down the game. And if you want a session like that, and if your players enjoy that, great. 
But if you have an entire castle with like 40 rooms and there's maybe two rooms that are important and the rest is just storage, an armory, an old bunker, whatever, uh, be prepared (laughs) for them to go through every room. And that might be an instance where you can say it's an old abandoned castle. A lot of the stuff is broken. Uh, You know, you notice you hear a sound coming from the north end. What do you do? That kind of thing. And then just streamline going through it instead of having this really intricate map that takes your players three hours to just go through and not really find anything. So the that is definitely a con. Room by room. Yes, that's definitely a con. I've heard a lot of DMs say with maps. And I have noticed myself, even in smaller situations, the room by room dungeon crawl does slow down gameplay. It just slows it's it down. Really, it's really tedious. Yeah. Yeah. And... I'm not saying that's bad because we love playing D and D and we'll play it all the time. But if you're trying to get them somewhere during that session, the it's not going to happen. Like you're, you're just going to have to anticipate that it'll probably just happen next session. So have you noticed that when you did, when we did dungeon crawls, did you notice that? Yeah. uh, That's one of the reasons that I don't like to run dungeon crawls. I just think there it's too many details and it's a room by room description. It's one of the reasons I don't like using modules is Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I have to flip through like, what room are you in now? They're, they're never laid out. The players never move linearly through the rooms. They will never move the way that Chris Perkins intended through the module, right? Like they're never going to (laughs) go a1 to a2 to a like so you're constantly jumping back and forth and then somebody's going to double back because the bracelet in a1 sounded really interesting and then you got to scroll back or like flip back yeah. through and if it's a map that i created like i usually put a visual indicator for myself um it's a jewelry box so there's going to be jewelry there and you yeah. know there's a treasure chest and maybe there's going to be no it's a mimic um you know like you can kind of ad lib like what's inside uh, on the go but um having to scroll back and forth for descriptions like really hinders me when we're running a game that's like if i can avoid that at all costs that's my preference and i've done that with the module as i have if you've gone into a person's house or you're going to a person's house i will just highlight the important stuff and then if i if you are like dead set and exploring this person's bedroom um i will refer to the description, but I won't. Otherwise, it's just I just have you guys the important stuff I have memorized and then the rest I'll kind of refer. But you're right. The players sneak in the back window and all of a sudden you're in the second floor in the master bedroom. You didn't go through the office. You didn't go through the kids rooms. You didn't go through the kitchen. Didn't trigger uh, that trap in the hall. You didn't trigger that trap. You're coming in the back and you're like, what? What are you? OK? And you're frantically scrolling or looking through your book trying to find where you are, where this player is. And inevitably the rest of the group is somewhere else. And so you're having to jump back and forth in that section of the module, trying to be like, okay, you're downstairs in the dining room and you're upstairs in this room. And it can get really confusing really fast. So, you know, and that instance, maybe having a map would be good so that you can have one player and one thing seeing something else and then versus another but i yeah godspeed to you if you can <laughs> if you can keep track of where everybody is um yeah caveat we probably should have opened with also is that um you should ask your players right before you sit down for a yeah. you know a new campaign that's yeah. one of the things that you can say in session zero is when we run encounters when we talk about combat when we move through exploration how do you feel about theater of the mind versus maps? Is there a blend that you'd like? Mm-hmm, do you mm-hmm. have a hard preference for one or the other? And that can help sort of manage expectations because if you feel like my players need a map every single time and in the in the survey, the players fill out, nah, I almost never need a map except, you know, to measure distances on my spells. Mm-hmm. And if we're not going to use maps, maybe I'll play a fighter instead. Um, you know, that's going to impact the way they interact with the game and it's going to impact their enjoyment and your enjoyment. Uh, maps do something really well though for me personally that i love which is uh that they can be a jumping off tool for building a session or as a source of inspiration and it's funny because just today um i was looking at a map and somebody had left a comment 
about having been referred by um, a Matt Colville video. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I had to go dig that. I had to go watch mm-hmm. that. I like his stuff a lot. Um, he's got and great he did stuff. the video. Yeah, he did a video yeah. as of this recording, like just a couple days ago. Uh, prep can be literally easy and actually fun. And it was really good talking about using maps um, to create an encounter and build a session around and using like like just finding something interesting and using that as a jumping mm-hmm. off tool. And I use, I do that all the time. We've talked about this before when you're building an encounter or when you're prepping your session. Uh, and I remember we had this conversation with Lou and Aka from Tabletop Journeys as well. And he mm-hmm. said the same thing. Sometimes an image or a map or something will help me build my encounter. And I will map out the session based on what this map or this image kind of gets stirring in my brain. And that helps me so much, uh, you know, I find this map and I'm like, oh, you know, it'd be really fun. What if we did a, and maybe these NPCs and maybe this kind of story beat and the players might interact with it in an unexpected uh, and totally different way, which they always do. Right. Uh, But that, but having that groundwork of a map there Mm -hmm. kind Mm -hmm. of often will help me roll into what I want to prep for the session, what needs to be there, what I think I can make up on the fly. uh, And, you know, what I'm frantically photoshopping in the background as everyone else <laughs> is asking questions and throwing in some sort of polymorphed uh, wild shape bullshit in the last second, <laughs> the last it's minute. Purple ape, a giant purple ape. But I had it's to... an ape, but I'd like it to be enlarged and it needs to be and purple. And purple. can it shimmer? Could it shimmer? I think that'd be great. And it's prone. Uh, oh, yeah, and it's prone. Yeah. No, that you're right. You have the map, and it's just such a good basis and uh, inspiration. And then you can, you can be like, okay, so I have this map, what monsters would be here? And what would, uh, would there be any like difficult terrain for the characters or there would be any traps for the characters or would there be anything they find? Maybe there's an NPC hiding here. It, it can be having a really good map can be such, like you said, it's such a great jumping off point and inspire you for what you're going to center that session around. And I actually, with Curse of Strahd, have a bunch of their players are currently in the town of Velaki, and I have a bunch of battle maps that are just top down of the street. And yes, I've been like dying to use these. And so we did a few sessions ago, we had some dire wolves break in and the players went to help to do that because I'm just like, I have all these street maps. <laughs> I need to use them. So I, I think, yeah, I think it was just the, more behind the screen. The players have just leveled up and I know they get antsy to use their new stuff. So I was like, we're going to do combat in this next session because I know as a player, as soon as I level up, I want to be slinging all the spells or whatever. So I was like, yep, let's, let's do some combat. And I just had these battle maps that I've been sitting on for a while. So yeah, I think they're, they're great for inspiration and laying the framework for you to enhance and make better, uh, role play session i do also keep a lot of um like generic town generic rural generic path uh maps <laughs> just as they're battle great. maps they're really great yeah because yeah. you never know when your players are gonna throw down with just something in the woods or each just. other or uh, each other we've done that where we're just like oh let's arm wrestle oh let's chop down a tree and do something so I think yeah. you're a doppelganger. Fight to the death. <laughs> Fight to the death. Yeah. I think, yeah, just generic maps for um or scenes of like in the forest or in the desert or wherever you know your setting is are great to have on hand to just throw something up there. Um, and then if you're struggling because of the suddenness of the combat, you do have something to kind of fall back on instead of just making up something. So yeah, I think I think they're definitely great in that aspect. Uh, I also think when we're talking about combat and the confusion about what's going on, the having some marker of you know, even if it's like this random street map, here you go, and everyone draw an X in the VTT, and that's your token, and just like move it around so, so you can see what's going on, um, hmm. both in person and in the and in virtual tabletops, uh, giving the players the ability to like count squares or use a measure tool or grab a ruler uh, when we play in person, like giving the players the um, the ability to do that, giving them that agency to kind of make decisions 
outside of their turn helps them kind of prepare for their turn. And uh, I, I do find that it speeds combat up a little bit. It means we're doing less of that. Okay, where am I standing? One more time. How far am I from the enemy? Okay, one more time. Do I think that it's close enough for Mage Hand or do like Poison Spray or like, do you think that that's out of range of my Firebolt or like just giving them something to work on so they can even, even if it's just close, right? Like we see a lot on uh, streaming shows where the players are like, that looks like 15 feet. Do I know if that's 15 feet in the yes. channel? Say like, yeah, you do think it's close, but you're yeah. not sure. Like your, your skill with your own magic or your own abilities allows you to understand that that's probably within the range uh, that you can hit, but and that feels really realistic to me. Like I think if I, you know, am a great axe thrower, um, I have a pretty good idea of mm -hmm. how far mm -hmm. of a target I can hit. But like mm -hmm. when you start talking about fifteen plus feet, you're like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I can hit that, um, and I have a honed skill that you know works with that. Mm -hmm. And when I go to throw the axe, it's always going to be a, it's always going to be a dice roll, right? Um, kind of, like literally. But that comes into if you were doing say theater of the mind for the battle and someone say cast a fireball and blew up a couple of their companions or hit a couple of their companions and they didn't intend to they would have known not to do yeah. that and so the dm would have had to intervene at that point and be like if you do that you're you have you know allies within 10 feet and you have to just be extremely thorough about what you're describing and even just a grid like you said with x's would just make the characters or make the players just be more aware of what they're doing um i think it could get tedious if you didn't <laughs> for combat but it can be done i think i the the combat i've seen done by dms without maps has been small it's been maybe one enemy or two like for example in one case there were some guards that stopped them from going somewhere and they weren't wanted to fight them. And so he made him roll initiative. Uh, this was Chris Perkins, actually. Uh, he made him roll initiative. And then the fight was pretty quick. They were just guards. They had like 10 hit points. It was not the big yeah. deal. Yeah, they were right there. It was all close melee range. Yeah. And yeah. And so it was over pretty quickly. And I think if you have a great big map or a great big area and a bunch of big monsters or one big monster, I think... That would be, I, I would definitely use a map of some sort. The, yeah, the tools are there to facilitate the game. Mm -hmm. And I think I always have to sort of remind, uh, not necessarily myself, but it is like sort of like a, the general reminder to the masses. It's like, it, that's, this isn't an, a gotcha moment. This isn't an opportunity for a yeah, gotcha moment. Theater correct. of the Mind is yeah. a tool to facilitate your game, not a trap for your players to step in. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Th that's my like cautionary tale moment just don't gotcha your players that feels bad no one likes that and there's also a big debate about when you have too many maps or your players are just constant your characters are constantly on maps you're moving into is this a video game is this yeah is this not a ttrpg where we just make up things in our head but like are we just moving into game territory and that's a big debate right now with animated tokens or animated spells or maps that are completely animated. Or I, I think there was a couple that you sent me links to where you roll or you say like how far you want to move and it automatically moves your token. Or um, I know with um, Foundry, there are some people that use mods and you roll an attack and it shows an animated attack and then it takes away the damage and it does, I mean, it does like all the stuff for you and all you do is roll the dice. And it's like we're we're getting into like video game experience. And I know that's just a big hot topic right now that a lot of people are like, it's taking away from the authentic uh, D and D experience and moving too far. But then other people are like, no, this is amazing. We should still use this, especially people playing remotely like we do. We should use all of these tools and um, make a better experience. I don't know. What are your thoughts? That's interesting because on one hand, um, yeah, I agree. There is like an authenticity to um, a theater of the mind game and then simple maps. And I'm a big advocate of animated maps. I really think they're very fun. Um, same. And no, at the same I love time, it's like, 
I just love them. I just think they're so cool. It's yeah. cool. It's cool yeah. immersion. Yeah. yeah. And uh, at the, uh, you know, at the risk of being on a soapbox here, I think that like immersion tools can help, um, help make your game more accessible to players who have other needs, especially when we were talking about like ADHD and like, how do I, how do I build a game that my players can better immerse themselves into? And if that means using the dry erase markers and the grid or using an animated map or using some exciting flashy graphics, if that's what I enjoy running and that's what they enjoy playing, then great. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's also, you know, there's also the element of like, oh my God, I'm just trying to have fun. I'm just trying to play a game. I need, I need you to just let us do, do it the way you want to do it. And I'm going to run mine the way I run mine. Um, do, does, uh, the TV screen in the table with the custom lights around it that we did that one time for the, for an in-person game, like, is that gamifying it too, like video gamifying yeah. it too much? Yeah. Yeah. Like, not to me, I felt like that was a really fun, like, way for the players to get really immersed at the table. Uh, but and we yeah, were. There's, we were. All of us. It was, yeah. it was really cool. Yeah. But you're right. Yeah, where's so the line? Like, yeah. you know, when Does there need Dungeons to be Dragons a line? first came out. Yeah, there was an EV line. When Dungeons and Dragons first came out and it was just grid maps and just, you know, pencil and paper. And then it became actual maps and then it became, you know, digital where I I feel like it's only improving and enhancing the gameplay experience. Uh, I know you and I have played uh, Boulder's Gate online, and it's pretty close to D anD. d You roll the dice. It's kind of similar, yeah. It's, it's similar. It's got a lot of the similar aspects. However, it is not D anD. d No, it's, <laughs> it's not. not. It's super it's not. not. Like, and they they take a lot of it from D anD. d Like I said, you roll the dice to get your responses or to get your actions and there are different routes you can take when you make your choices uh it's definitely you know it's an rpg but it's not D D. I would never even compare it to the experience you get playing actual D D. so i think i personally i am looking to embrace the new tools i think it'd be fun and you could always as you said take your player's direction. If you start playing it and they're like, yeah, they're just, they seem like they're just not engaging or it just seems like it's so much prep or it just seems really difficult for them to navigate whatever platform you're using. then I would back off for sure. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I don't know if there is a line. I think, well, so if it's too much to prep for sure, like don't do mm -hmm. it. That's fine. Mm -hmm. And if it's, and if your players aren't engaged with it or if you don't like it, don't do it. Mm -hmm. But I, I think for me, the delineation between when it becomes something else is when the story no longer revolves around the players and their decisions. When the when the story is predetermined, like including outcomes, um, it, you know, when we have like a binary path or like just a couple of ending options, that's when it's like this wasn't a story that we wrote together. Yeah, like yeah, I, I think a really really well. Uh, crafted D, D game is a story that the players fully can take hold of and run with and 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 at the end of the day we say that series of sessions that campaign we ran together was wholly unique and entirely our piece that we built together and that to me is the the biggest difference between like a video game and what i believe D, &D really is at its core Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm at a lot of soapboxes. I got a real high horse today, I guess. <laughs> I love your soapboxes. <laughs> the and best. another thing. And another thing. <laughs> so as a player currently, because I'm the one DMing from the player's seat, what maps have you found the most helpful and which ones have you found like I could have done without in our current curse of a straw campaign? Ooh, good I mean, question. If you, if you I have any, I don't know. Last Sunday, last session, mm -hmm. we, um, the players got a wild hair. They decided they were going to button some stuff up and they were going to just move on out of town. 
Uh, and we really had you working to su- to like shuffle through those maps. <laughs> yeah, um, that was that was a I, hard session to run. Yeah. yeah, I felt really bad because um, we had seen a lot of those places. I didn't think that we needed the map again. And even I think at some point, someone in the session said like. You don't have to pull them up for us. Like, I feel like we're really making you sweat over there. Uh, we're like, cool, we're going to pop out of the hotel room and we're going to go over to um, the the guy who makes the caskets. And then actually we're going to pop over to the Blushing Begonia. Actually, we're going to run down to... And like, we we like, we like really cycled through the places and that feels yeah. like a bit extreme. Um, no, I feel like I've loved all the visual aids so much. Uh, like, I, I don't think there have been any that I would say. I was really confused about the obelisks, though. I got really fixated on the fact that there were four instead of three. But like, <laughs> I'm so sorry. A, that is I a me problem. <laughs> I don't know. And that map was made specifically for Curse of Strahd, specifically for Outside the Bone. So I don't know why the artist decided to put four. I, I don't know. There's, there's. Yeah, it should represented. Have been it represented the bond that we had. I, don't know. To the- I should. Yeah, I. I feel like I maybe should reach out to him. Be like, so this really confused my players. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. we were fine. We survived. Last session. Yeah, last session you did. You went from like one place to another place to another place, and in hindsight, and I started to do that towards the end of the session. You guys started bouncing around. You had been some of these places before. I. I believe one of them, I just put the exterior of the building up just for like general ambiance. And then I just forget that. But the other places you had not been before. And so I had the maps and I was waiting and I did not anticipate you going to these new places. And so I felt the need we to really, show you because you hadn't we been really there. wrapping it up. But yeah. <laughs> you were. And um, so the other, so I started doing that. I Towards the end of the session, I was like, okay, I'm just going to, this is ambiance. You just get the outside of the church. You guys have to figure out from there. But because you had been the other places. And I think that's a great tip for DMs is if they already had been to the clothing store or they already had been to the inn or whatever, you don't need to. And they're rushing back and forth. I would just like you, I think you suggested just leave the general town map up or something and call it good. Because I know there was a little bit of urgency last session. And so if your players are zipping around trying to get things done, um, yeah, I would I would not recommend trying to cycle through those while trying to explain things. So pivotal plot points, like a whole bunch of them in an hour. It was intense. Oh, we cruised through that story, which is funny. <laughs> Usually this group... Did does not cruise through a story usually this yeah. group is like um or we could go philandering like it, it was full-blown chaotic D. it was amazing i loved running it but i was like <laughs> oh we're doing this now oh we're doing this now so yeah i would and i think uh your husband my brother isaac it was really good about he just give us the general town map remember that or the region map mm-hmm. we had a lot yeah. of just region map and i think that's smart on his part because if we are exploring somewhere in the forest or we're just role playing or we're just walking along the road general map like just general map and it just it does help to kind of ground you where you are and i think did he have a cart and like he would move like it along where we were get a little on like the world map yeah like oregon trail style like you could see where you were going it was really charming like i really really enjoyed it and so i think every dm has their own style and that was a style that probably made his life a lot less hectic compared to how I was trying to run it. So that's also, well, it kind of throws me back to when you first started DMing again and you had all these new tools, like you were used to the player side Mm -hmm. of things. You had Mm -hmm. all these new tools and it was like, I'd really like the soundscape you'd be playing, but I can't manage that many things at once. I'm trying to juggle all these maps and you would ping me and say like, Hey, can you run this playlist? And so we were helping you manage the music in yeah. the beginning yeah. um, because like you're trying to run a game, you're kind of busy. Uh, yeah. And like, sure. I grew six more arms and managed like, th- like when I was running games, like I loved that. I lived for it. It was like, and now you learned like, okay, so how do I work this into foundry so that the players mm-hmm. can, like, I can just move them onto this map and it'll just start the playlist. Like you found a way to integrate that in a way that works for you. 
Yes. Because yeah. it can get really overwhelming to try to manage all those pieces. So does that mean we're flipping through maps at every location that the players are going to go to, or we pick a world map, or we go to some sort of like general setting art, and then everything is theater of the mind. Like it's all about finding that level of how much effort or energy you want to spend session over session before you like, yeah, just how much effort do you want to put in? Absolutely. Don't overwork yourself. Yeah. And, and that's something I think we didn't talk about too, with you have the battle map, but the music and there is nothing as a player that like, I don't want to say trigger, but excites me is when the music changes, when the battle music starts, it's like, Oh, it's on now. And I don't care if it's just a blank slate of a map. Like, I think the music just, you just are conditioned to getting excited. And so if you can figure out how to play music, even in a live session and change it for battle music, I think that makes a tremendous difference. Even if your map is just kind of plain, um, I think that just helps with the immersion. Yeah. Even, even the grid and the whiteboard marker, it's like Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hitting that button on your phone that starts the dramatic playlist. It really it helps communicate expectations. It helps manage expectations for the players. Something intense is happening. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Transmission received. Um, yeah, and that, exactly. Exactly. That game of managing expectations is, I think, a lot of what theater of the mind versus map, like, I, I think that's what that comes down to is how do we yeah. manage expectations in a way that mm-hmm. uh, everyone feels like they're immersed in the game and we can just tell our story together. We just want to tell our story together. That's all we want to do. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there were a lot of pros and cons, but in the end, theater of the mind or map making, the winner is uh, whatever works best for you, ultimately. Uh, So thanks for joining us on this exploration of engaging your players and telling a story together. Uh, We have been out of initiative, but we're going to get back into it. So get out there, roll some dice, tell some stories, and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye! Thanks for listening to Out of Initiative, a podcast from Merely NPCs. For more from Sarah and Morgan, follow them on TikTok at Merely NPCs or visit them online at MerelyNPCs.com.